want to take a closer look at IO. Um, IO is a mostly rocky body, so it has a higher density than Oberon or Titania did, right? More rock instead of more ice. Um, its yellow and orange appearance is because of sulfur compounds that react with its surface. Um, its atmosphere is composed of sulfur dioxide, which comes from volcanic activity. And the rock inside of Io is kept molten by tidal heating from Jupiter. So I wanna take a step back and think about Io's atmosphere here because the secondary atmospheres of the terrestrial planets formed in a way. What was that way? Yes, so the secondary atmospheres consisted largely of sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, which both came from outgassing from molten rocks. So Io is essentially creating a secondary atmosphere for itself still now. Uh, just as a mini review, the secondary atmospheres came from volcanoes. The primary atmospheres were just the hydrogen and helium that were around when the planets formed. So I've, I saw some feedback that this kind of idea of the primary, secondary, and current present day atmospheres is a little confusing. So just remember that all the secondary atmospheres came from outgassing. They just came from volcanic activity. So they're all fairly similar in composition mostly CO2 and sulfur dioxide. All right, so if both of those gases were added to a secondary atmosphere of Io by molten rock through its volcanism, but now it only has sulfur dioxide in it, um, what's heavier, carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide? So basically, sorry, let me make this an up and down pole. What, what contributed to the sulfur dioxide stain? Yeah, so the sulfur dioxide is heavier and therefore its average molecular speed is gonna be lower. So it would be less likely to escape. All right, we see current um, evidence of volcanic eruptions on Io's surface. And in fact, we can actually see on like human timescales uh, changes driven by volcanism. So you can see these kind of dark um, plumes at the center of the image changing over time, and also the intensity of this orange ring around that volcano changing over time. So I think this is pretty awesome. How is Io so active? Well, it's internally heated by tidal heating. So um, I guess this is an opportunity to reiterate um, some misconceptions that came up on the homework in the past were that the tidal forces only depend on the total amount of gravitational force, but that's not true. Tidal forces depend on the difference on either side of an object. So for the example of Io, Jupiter pulls more strongly on the near side and less strongly on the far side of Io. And as a result of this difference in force, there's a little bit of flexing that happens. The flexing is smallest at perihelion because the difference in force is small due to the overall force being weaker. It's farther away, so the difference between the two sides is less. So it's the same reason the tidal force from the sun is less than the tidal force from the moon. The moon is closer, so the difference between the forces on either side of Earth are, are bigger for the moon. Okay, and then in the case of Io, as it moves around in its orbit, then as it gets closer to the planet, the flexing is gonna get bigger. The difference in force is gonna get larger. And at um, aphelion, it's going to have the greatest difference in force. So it'll have the greatest amount of flexing. And so basically as Io moves around in its orbit around Jupiter, it's going to experience more and less flexing due to stronger and weaker tidal forces at each of those positions. So it's kind of like if you, um, I don't know, if you bend a wire a bunch of times, it gets warm where it's been bent. The same thing, it's basically friction forces that are heating the interior of IO due to all this flexing. Okay, um, let me 
show you the math for the tidal force because I don't think I have shown you this before. But when we look at tidal force as a difference in force, the difference in the gravitational force on two sides of a body, um, we can calculate this um, difference in force. I'm not going to go through the derivation. Um, so um, what this means is that the tidal force, delta F, is directly proportional to the mass of the planet. It's directly proportional to the mass of the moon and to the diameter of the moon, meaning that larger moons would experience a greater tidal force, um, as well as more massive moons and more massive planets. But the force is inversely proportional to the semi-major axis cubed, meaning that moons far away from a planet would experience less of a tidal force. All right, so to summarize those, we could put it like this. Um, if I increase the mass of my planet, then my tidal force will go up. If I increase the diameter of the planet, or sorry, the moon, the tidal force will go up. And if I increase the distance from the planet to its moon, then my tidal force will go down. And because it's cubed, the tidal force it depends a lot more on the distance to the moon than it does on either the mass or the diameter. So the greatest influence on the size of the tidal force is gonna be the distance to the orbiting object. Okay, so thinking about this, then we can come back to our Galilean moons and consider their different distances from Jupiter. Um, so these are, now they're out of order. They're not in order of their orbital distance, um, but Io is very close to Jupiter. And so its tidal force is very large. So no surprise, Io has a lot of tidal heating and that's what's driving its volcanism. Ganymede also experiences a high tidal force. Um, even though it's farther than Europa, it's a larger and more massive moon than Europa. So you can see there is some impact here from the mass and the diameter. And then Callisto, because it's the farthest moon in the system, um, it has the lowest tidal force. Compare all that to our own moon, and our own moon has a relatively low tidal force compared to any of these. So Earth does not tidal heat our own moon. Um, I mean, the biggest impact here is this variable, right? Uh, the mass of planet Earth is a whole lot smaller than the mass of Jupiter. So there would be no reason to think that we would tidally heat our moon from the tidal forces on, on the moon. All right. So to check on this whole discussion of tidal heating, which one of these is not a factor that explains why Io experiences tidal heating? Okay, yeah, lots of productive ideas here. So maybe also you're interpreting three as one thing, but I think I meant a different thing. Io's orbit is equatorial with respect to Jupiter. So its orbit is not inclined with respect to any of the other, I think I should have just said Galilean moons, but you're also right. Other planets, Saturn would be far too far away for it to affect Io's orbit. Um, so yes, three is not the best choice. Um, so the question is, does the ellipticity of Io's orbit make any difference? And um, it does, in fact. So the resonance with those other moons does have a small effect on the tidal heating. Um, and you know they're close enough to actually affect that tidal force. But like I said before, less influential than Jupiter because of their small mass. So three is not a relevant factor, but everything else is relevant. 